I got I got a couple of few bands I work with out of New York City. Um, I play in a couple myself. I play with the Gil Evans Orchestra once in a while. And uh, I have my band, called, you know, word of mouth, um, with various members, you know, whoever's in town, that, that I also use, you know, you know, in the New York area. And uh, I have a steel drum band that I, that I play with out of Florida. I got a, a, something, you know, we've already recorded. I'm trying to get that, you know, some label to pick that up. So that's about, and basically, you know, some new music all the time. Some rhythm and blues, basically. Who were your uh, influences when you were starting the first part? Did you have any particular ones? Or? Just the radio, anything on the radio, any any form of music at all. You know, just whatever, you know, you turn on the radio, that was it. I like m mainly rhythm and blues, that's my, that's my forte, you know, like funk and all that, you know, Sam and Dave, that era, that, that was my big influence. And any pop music too, anything that was on pop radio. What do you, what do you think that you practice that helps you keep music great facility on the band? You felt really helps you get out there? Like mainly uh, cello studies. I, I studied lots of cello stuff because it's, it's very difficult because it's tuned in fifths and they, they go like this, you know, well, we, we just, you know, going across and forth and super melodic and um, excellent for your chops. It just keeps you, keeps you busy. Bass books for me, for me were a little, there was not that much in it. You know, some Mandel book, that was it. That was the only bass book out. So I just went, to, I went and found anything I could, get a violin book or listen, listen to piano players. I, I was mainly listening to other things. Yeah, I like the way Jerry played. He played on uh, a lot of the Muscle Shoals stuff and uh, a lot of the Atlantic stuff. He was a big influence on me. I, you know, that's basically where I'm from, you know, with, with, the, with the bass, you know, the, the R&B thing. I mainly got them out of books. Just go out and get Dot, I remember Dotsour was, was like the main guy. Uh, Dotsour, 113 cello studies. They're pretty amazing. You know, just... Basically, finding most stuff like that. Violin studies are good too. You know, get get the old box stuff, all that. You know, the, the uh, how you say the inventions, all those things. They they they're, they're good for the hand. Definitely. You ever see the possibility of playing with like three chords? Well, Joe and Wayne, I think, just broke up now. You know, so I don't know what they're up to. They're, they're, they're for the first time in, what, since 1970, 71, you know, they're doing their own things. I really haven't left Weatherport, you know. I'm just not with the band right now, you know, because it's just, that's, it's that sort of a band. You know, lots of things happen in people's lives, you know. We never broke up. I just had to do other things. They had other things to do, you know, family things. There's lots of stuff that happened. So right now, Weatherport is totally on hold. So I don't know what what will happen next with that. But I would I would definitely play with him again. I probably will play with him again. We'll probably get together sometime. But I know Joe and Wayne just broke up. So in fact, Wayne's going out on tour in a couple of days. Let's talk to him. You said you had all those projects going in New York. Do you like the playing atmosphere there better, or do you just like New York? Well, the good thing about New York is it's concentrated. You can fall out your front door, man, and do everything in the world within 10 minutes, you know. So, you know, I mean, you know, so you don't need nothing. And you can walk everywhere. You can walk to 300 clubs and see everybody in the world in 15 minutes. So, you know, that's good about New York. I mean, there's a lot. It's, you know, you can't complain about really. I mean, you can complain about being out of work. Work's cutthroat, you know. It's, it's, it's very cutthroat in New York. But most all the players are there. You know, I mean, you ain't got nothing to do. You can walk down the street and you be, you see somebody. You you know, I mean, you can't walk ten blocks without without seeing at least three hundred guys. You know, it's, that that's what I like about New York. Cutthroat about it is you know it's it's rough. It's just, you got to be ready for it. California's a lot. Big. What? Well, always spread out. You gotta have a car out here. In New York, you don't need a car. You just walk. I mean, you walk everywhere in a couple of minutes. You know, it's a lot easier. 
a little bit, not much. I don't do that, uh, however you call it. I mean, a little bit. Not, I don't do it very good. Do you just do these major projects, or do you get calls to do, like, Chrysler commercials and that kind of stuff? When you're... I don't do that. They're, they're a line of guys in New York that do all that stuff. You know, they've had it sewn up for years, and they make all sorts of big money, and they don't let anybody get into it because they don't, they don't want to lose their gigs because they're, they're good gigs. You know, it's, it's tough to get in those things. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big quick. I mean, I'll do anything that comes along. Basically, I just like to, I like to come up with new stuff, you know, like innovative stuff that nobody's got. You know, it's just dangerous stuff. <laughs> you know, everybody's afraid to try. That's, that's what I do. I'm a scout. Do I? Yeah, you know, we, we in musical taste, you know. I don't like to overdo it, but they're there. You know, I use them. I haven't played that music, that's tough. I could try it, but it, it is, I know I've not played it. It's all there. I was just tuning up. You know, I was just tuning up the bass one day, and you know, I was just tuning it up, and I just heard it. it. Sounded, you know, musical to me. It's like, then, you know, then, you know. They were all there, so I just, you know, figured out what they were note wise. Went across all the strings. You can just about play a legit chromatic scale with just, just with these four strings. You know, it's tough. I forget it. I figured it out once. Almost. I think you're missing one note. So that they're all in there. It's just a matter of uh, the, the main thing to make that stuff musical. I mean, you always hear everybody on records hit these little chords, which anybody can do. That's corny, you know. I mean, anybody can do that. The thing is to figure out where all the notes are and what they are, and then use them. You know, like combine them into little chords. You know, there's not all that much you can do because it's open. You can do like you know, fake ones. I do with my thumb, guitar players do with their fingers. You do that. Or uh, the thing with the open harmonics, there's only so many of them, is just to know them. You know? And then the other thing is like, use, you know, you use this like a capo and, you know, and then pick them in half. So, you know, it's very basic. The main thing is just learning what all the notes are so that, just so that you can use them. I mean, there's only so many notes up there, but when you know where they're at, it's, it's, you know, it's very effective to throw them in. Oh, I know that. 
I just heard him a little bit yesterday or the day before. He sounded pretty good. Sounded nice. Yeah. Jeff sounded real good. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I never happened to across a weather report concert, just you know, whatever. Never saw Jocko live except on the records. So the other day when we first met, we. I, he says that I had never seen you play, and I said, you know, I hadn't seen you play. And it was just an interesting thing to, for the first time, seeing somebody, you know, who you know of for so long. And uh, I think it's, like, really good for everybody here just to see uh, what a, a musician like this can do and what he has to say outside of the studio. Because, you know, a studio thing is obviously prepared to showcase the very best for everyone to listen to. And there's a lot of facets and a lot of sides to a player, so I think it's really good that you can check out all the facets other than just the preparedness of a musician. Like, do you know what I'm saying? That a lot of musicians are deeper than merely the tune on an album. So I, maybe your questions can be directed to that in terms of writing. I mean, the guy writes full orchestral stuff. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of, of, of real pertinent information you want to pursue that I yeah. Do you uh, basically write everything you do, or sometimes you go in on the studio and you have a song, and you just basically say jam it in a sense? It's basically basically written, more or less. I mean, I mean there's stuff. I remember the weather for what we had. Sometimes we'd have the most amazing, amazing music, and it would sound totally as if we had. We'd even comment to ourselves. Let's say this stuff was written note for note, and this stuff would sound the freest. And then we would play some free shit, and it would be, you know, it would sound real technical because we were so tight. So it's, um, but we, we we always have some sort of a format, definitely, you know, always. And uh, as far as like approaching something, it, it depends on in the studio how much time you have to deal with. It. You know, if you have some time up front, you know, you come, you know, you come up with some, you know, some some newer things. I like to look at stuff before I have to go in and play it personally, just so I'm ready for it. You know, just so. You don't walk in and, and then fumble around and you know, make a fool of yourself. I, I like to know basically what's going on first, and then. But then I don't like to overdo it, so it's still fresh. You know, I don't want. I don't want to go in and sound practiced ever. Just hit it. But definitely, we, we have. It's just usually planned out. You know. On a soul like uh, used to be a cha cha. How much time did you spend on that before going into the studio? How spontaneous was that solo? That's, it was pretty spontaneous, but I, I remember that first album. <clears throat> those solos are pretty ridiculous. I practiced a lot, a lot of different things to throw in there, I definitely. Because, I mean, it was my, my debut, and I came out, you know, I was like 23 years old, and I just said, you know, i got to come out with something powerful. And so I was, I was practicing that stuff, because that stuff was hard. They were all one takes, you know, everything. So, you know, I was, I was pretty nervous. But and I had practiced a lot of stuff. I had, I had a lot of planned things for all those tunes, you know, what I was going to play. I mean, that stuff is too good. You can't just make all that stuff. I was going to say, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll admit that myself. Or, <laughs> 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 on your album, Word of Mouth, is that all written out, too? All that obscure stuff that you did on that? What parts? <laughs> the whole album was like, really way out. Well, there's two, there's two part, there's two tunes on side one are totaled. The one tune is, is the L.A. Symphony, you know, that can't be too obscure. I mean, it's a ballad, you know, that that's not obscure. And then two after that, Liberty City is, is all, you know, most, everything except for the first tune is written out. And what was that written about, Liberty City? Liberty City, Florida, Miami, okay. Florida, when they did the Liberty City, when they had the Liberty City riots. That's where I grew up. That's where I wrote that stuff. Yeah, it, in fact, it was funny because I named it Liberty City, and I didn't really have a name for it. I'd call it High Life or something because it was sort of like a reggae. And uh, I, I finally I said, wait, I'm going to call it Liberty City. And I woke up the next day, and it was Liberty City riots. It, it was really it was strange. They, did, they had not had the Liberty City riots, which, of course, were the biggest racial riots of, of you know, the 70s, I guess. So it was, 
It was strange when I saw that. You play mostly with two fingers or three? Two. I use these these fingers I use to uh, like to mute my thumb and these fingers I use like to you know when you're playing you know so as not to make so much noise you know which which is actually harder than playing really that's that's the hardest stuff it's really going is to not make noise with the other strings when, excuse me I never have I never have I use my thumb quite a bit you know, just like stopping and picking, you know, like quick. And using the, um, your last two fingers for a dead and string, um, how'd you go about working on that? I didn't try to build that up and can I tell you, it's, it it's tough. It's very tough because, <laughs> in fact, when people ask me about right hand technique, I, I really don't consider I even have any. And, it, and I know it's tougher than the left hand. It's, I just don't think about it. I mean, that, that's a really rotten answer, I know, but I just don't think about it. You know, you just have to, it's totally by feel. It just, you know, I mean, you'll be playing, you'll have to think about it, you know, you're making a lot of noise, so try to get your hand over there. That's about the best I can explain it. Get over there, and then, then you have the problem of not, you know, muting the notes that you're playing, you know. You know so it's, it's, it's a little tough. I see, I see some guy the other day was just playing all over the place. This is very impressive. Like he had his arm, like he had his arm muted. I couldn't believe it. It's, it's, it's tough though. Maybe, maybe what you do is just you just let him fall really light, just like barely touching the instrument. Can you rest your thumb on the string, or does your thumb just stay? I rested on the E string and the pickup. That's where I rest my thumb. Do you always play with a light touch, even if the sound is kind of real forceful? I I play usually with a real hard hard touch yeah. all the time. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, I play with a hard touch, and and <clears throat> when I'm playing the fretless with a tone, I'm usually playing pretty hard too to get it to you know dig into the neck, you know, to get that growl. You know, but I usually pick pick pretty hard. Do you break strings much, or do you pretty much know how, how hard you can hit it without doing that? I, I, mean, I never break strings. I broke a string when I was a kid, went in my left eye and tore it off, so I made a habit not of breaking strings after that. And I mean, I play very hard. I, mean, I throw my bass around, break it, I do all sorts of stuff. I, I, I don't break strings. How do you change your Well, when I'm working real hard, I, tr I try to change them every night, you know. You know, when, when you can afford it, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah, can you talk about your uh, role in Joe Mitchell's Mendes, like what was asked of you, or if you were given more of a free hand? Uh, I came in on that day. In fact, we did it right down the street over at uh, A&M. And um, I called up Herbie to do it, because Herb, she didn't really, she had some English piano player really couldn't play it transcribe the music, so I got Herbie Hancock to come down, and uh, I was more or less sort of a co-leader. I did some arranging on it and stuff, and uh, no, I, I was, I, like I said, this guy had trans, trans, this guy from England had transcribed uh, all of these Mingus tunes, which she had wanted to do, which she wrote words to, to like the saxophone melodies or, you know, whatever, and uh, and we went at it like that. I mean, we had to play the tunes, but she definitely, you know, which was strange because I'm playing my Fender bass. I'm playing bass guitar for an upright eulogy album, more or less, you know. And uh, we had electric piano and stuff. And it was hip. I like I liked the way it was done. You know. I, I didn't want that old sound personally, so I know I had a lot to do with that. You know, getting an electric piano on it and stuff. You know, it came out very good. But, that, you know, we had to play. We had to play the music. The music was was down. We, uh, you know, getting Wayne and you know, then we call up Wayne, Wayne and Herbie. We just took it out. You know, playing Peter. I think Peter yeah, Erskine was on drums, so yeah, it was fun. But, but it was straight ahead. You know, they they knew what they wanted. There wasn't all that much freedom outside of just when they asked you to play something. You know, they just tell you. What about you. from Des Moines? Were you credited with the uh, horn arrangements? Yeah, I wrote all that. I wrote that in about five minutes. Just coming into just coming into the session. 
West Coast, I live on the East Coast, sort of hard to get in contact. I've, I've sat in with him several times, good friend of mine, but I, we've worked concerts together, you know, we, you know, on the same venue where I was on, in fact, I did a solo-based concert in Berlin once, and him and uh, Gary Burton, we were, the, we were on the same bill, but never worked with him, liked to, good player. His family's great, good friend of mine, we just, we just did a duet album out about a year or so. We don't really have a label for it. Yes? Uh, usually just uh, form and melody is basically it. The dynamics. I like to play dynamically, which I feel lots of people don't do. You know, which is an aspect of music I think people don't really use too much, but, you know. Like, you know. Well, do you much pretty, pretty much play what you're hearing in your head? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it, it, like, like something will just start happening, like a flow. You, you know, you got to know patterns. You, your hands got to know certain patterns. You know, you know certain things, certain licks. Like you said, a lick book. I don't know about that. <laughs> On stage, just pull it out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How are your kids doing? Okay, they're all in Florida. Uh, I I try to mainly, you know, concentrate on melody and form. You know, keep the form by all means. You can't, you know, I mean, unless you just go for everything you got. You know, but, uh, melody. I'm always, no matter whatever I'm playing, I'm I always have the melody going in my head. I'm probably Joe probably agree on that. Always have the melody going. I mean, I could be playing the most outside stuff, not even playing the right changes, but I'm still thinking the melody. Yeah, and that's that's the basic thing, right, Joe? That's it. Melody is the whole thing. So you stay on that. Keep that in your mind. I mean, you could be singing that to yourself while you're playing this other stuff. That's basically what I do. And, and if you listen to the stuff I've recorded, it, it stands pretty true. I usually keep to it because you always hear, you know, I'll jump in and I'll quote the melody, whatever, you know, play it upside down, whatever you do to keep that going. That's the, ba the, ma the main thing. Of course, and the melody is the form, I mean, basically. You know, form being, you know, chords and stuff, and you, you know, jump off. For someone as famous like you are, are there still some musician left you wish to play with or even dream to play with? Um, several musicians, musicians I've already played with, you know, and play again, just like asking if I would play with Weatherport again. I'd love to get back with John Wayne someday. But, you know, I haven't, I haven't played with Miles. I still have never been half all, all the guys in all my bands, Miles is using them. I still have never played with Miles, ever. And I'd like to play with Miles. You know, get back to play with Joe, you know. I haven't played with Joe in 10 years. Here's your chance. Yeah. 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 
I enjoy playing with good players, you know. Like my father said once, he says, Jock, you surround yourself with great musicians. And that's uh, what I like to do. I don't like to play by myself at all. It's boring. <laughs> Do you have any uh, recordings that are your personal favorites? What do you mean by that? Well, is there anything you like more than others that you recorded? Mm. I've recorded. Mitchell, whether you recorded, you stand up and you're more proud of? Not really. It's like I got four kids, none of them are my favorite, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That would be tough. <laughs> I haven't played in a long time. I might try a little later. You know, that's 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 a hard one. It's hard. I, I can play it slow, maybe. I mean, that first line is impossible on the bass. Because I, when I first learned it, I'm showing it to you slow because it's harder to play slow than fast. You know, once you get it in the pattern, I mean, I got to think playing it slow. I'm, I'm actually putting myself on the spot. Uh, tough tune. We used to do it, you know, with Ira, we used to play it so fast you couldn't even hear it. <laughs> and, and, and we we would hit every note too, you know. But it's it's easy. The pattern is easy. It's harder. Like I I never practice things fast, ever. I mean everything I practice slow. You know I just wait till I get on a bandstand like to like to start hitting, you know. But uh, mm. it's just, it's tougher than to concentrate. It's better too. It's it's tougher and it's better to practice slow and think of all the notes. It's because it's tough to get all that information in your head. I mean you know because you can just play the, I mean. Donna Lee, for instance, is basically, it sounds like a solo. It could be a solo Charlie Parker played on Back Home in Indiana. Who knows? But it's, it's bad. So um, when you stop and think about it, then, then it, it gives you some real insight into really playing on the stuff. Um, we have a question about Howard Roberts. He talked a lot about being a mental image of practicing. Do you ever use that uh, with your playing? Like, try mm -hmm. down the road thinking about things and your, how you play it? You mean like when you're not with your instrument or something? That's where I do most of my practicing. I, I very rarely practice. You know, like right now I'm practicing right now. I, I mean, I shouldn't be saying that to y'all. <laughs> you should practice. But, uh, but I mean, I, I work so much, you know. Like right now I've, I've sort of been taking some time off. But when I'm working, I work so much I really don't need to physically practice. I do all, virtually all my practicing gets in my head. And I do it usually, usually when I'm traveling, like like you said, in a car, or uh, like people always think I'm spaced out, you know, that I'm that I'm going out on them. But but I'm just be like, you know, exactly what you're talking about. I do practice without an instrument. I do it a lot, like just before I go to bed, I will just be laying down. Before I fall asleep, I just be laying down and think. And you can think real well. I mean, I can actually practice, and physically, it feels as if my hands are practicing, and I'm not. I'm just sitting there thinking. In fact, I was just doing that yesterday. I mean, you actually, you can feel your fingers actually doing it. I don't know if it makes any sense, but it does happen. Do you ever have dreams about music? <laughs> 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 when, when I did this album, Word of Mouth, I, I worked on it so hard that the, the music started like haunting me. I mean, I would go to sleep. I had this tune, Crisis, which is so out. And it, it's it's just like loony bin music. And, 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 and I would go to bed and that stuff, I could not, it would not leave me. So, but no, I, I don't usually dream about music now. I'm, I might dream about being on the road or something, you know, having some fun with the guys. But I, I, I don't dream about music. No. You played with a lot of great drummers. What are some of the things that uh, make you enjoy playing with one drummer over another drummer? Time. Remember what else? That's the only thing. The guy's got good time. That's that's a basic. That's the only thing there is in music, man. It's time. The guy's got bad time. Forget it. No, but I mean, like among the great 
All the great drummers don't have great time. I'm telling you, man, time is it. Once they got time, you know, it's just a matter of preference of, you know, dynamics is next for me. Time, dynamics, then form, you know, how they how they treat treat tunes, knowing what they're doing with the tune. You know, there's I mean there's a million different ways to approach a tune from a drum standpoint, you know. And then melodically playing. You know, melodically I I would say comes last for a drummer. I mean he's gotta be aware of the melody, but I mean m melody within the sound of the instrument. But well the, yeah, yeah, and the the melodic content of the sound even, that basic of sound. But basically time is it and if, you know if you if you ain't got time forget it you know you should you know quit playing drums get another gig that's all there is you know and time is very important so who would you say your favorite drummer is i don't have any favorites i told you that earlier but there's a bunch of them you know elvin jones uh max roach uh, tony you know tony williams d Jeanette. there's a man there's a bunch of them out there you know they're they're all great that's the only music I ever really hear. Just just whatever I hear on the street, walking down the street. You know, there'd be stores open, radios on. I don't I don't even have a record player anymore. You know, I just just listen to whatever I hear. You know, I like I like I like the you know commercial stuff that's going on. It's nice as long as it's got a beat. I have. I've played on several of them. You just don't know that I'm on them. But uh, I, I have. I have several things. I mean, my first album, I had a tune, "Come On, Come Over," with Sam and Dave, and that was very commercial. You know, they sh they were supposed to do something with them, they never did. So, um, I, I, that's what I want to do now. You know, like basically have an R&B band. That's my favorite type of music. That They just they keep calling me jazz player. Well, I mean, I can play jazz, but I consider myself a music, you know, musician. I don't really consider myself a jazz player. And you, it gets you in a lot of trouble being, you know, you know, work-wise, because, you know, jazz people that we don't have the best reputation, they just say, he's a jazz player. And then, then you don't get gigs playing rock rock gigs and funk gigs, which which is my major thing. I play rock and roll better than I play jazz, but, you know, you just don't get in it because, you, you know, you're a jazz player, and then they think you're going to come and play Donna Lee for the first time. Everybody's hiring to be. Yeah. Do you have anybody hiring to be? Yeah. Exactly. I'm self-taught. Formally self-taught. <laughs> It was tough because I I played my in fact my reading isn't all that good right now. I mean I'd have to practice two or three days and it would be right back back up to par. I just haven't read in a couple of years. But uh, well we could do that too. Yeah. 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 When you're when you're writing music, do you have a, do you write do you write a melody first, or do you have a groove in mind, and then you put melody to that, or how, how do you go about writing? That's a tough question because music just it comes out. And usually, what I do melody is usually the, the main thing. Groove is always the toughest to find a good rhythm for something. It's always tough. Mel melody usually is what comes out first, and form, and then then you got to come up with some sort of a groove. Uh, what I what I used to do, I used to write like every day. I used to write a tune. I mean, really write a tune. I mean, this was this is I mean, like for a year, you got 365 tunes. You know, you just sit down and make yourself write something that you think you haven't heard before. And uh, but of course, you know, my concentration level. I did that for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but I kept that that sort of attitude and, and, I, and I came up with writing like really incredible amounts of stuff lots of music and uh, what what I finally started doing was I would just I come up with some new, with some new music and then go to sleep on it don't write it down and then if I remembered it the next day then I would write it down and that, that's when I knew I had something good that's 
about it. That wasn't like where I cut it. Do you remember like the real nightmare games that you played where everything that fell apart was pretty critical? Several. <laughs> you, you usually bail them out somehow. I've, I've had some, some bad gigs. Not too many. Not too many, fortunately. But, you know, we're, there's lots of times where, you know, it, sometimes it, there's nothing you can do about it. There'll be weather against you, especially with out, outdoor concerts are tough. There's, you, that's times when lots of things can go wrong. Uh, so sometimes you would be in a funny club. Things can go wrong easy. Club owner don't dig you. You know, you go on and fight with the guys before you go on, and something's going to go wrong. But, uh, yeah, I've had a few. So we got way back there. Yeah, um, when you played with Ian Hunter a number of years ago, was that like session work, or did you know each other beforehand? Or? No, I just met him. The guy that had set up my first record deal was also working with, with Ian Hunter. It was his boy. And uh, he thought it would be good, seeing that I was coming out basically as a jazz, jazz sort of guy, which they were pushing me as, to come out immediately. And I did, the, you know, a rock and roll album, which was a very good album. And they didn't push that either. That was a very good album. Yeah, well, people talk about that. That's, that's, that's fun, yeah. And uh, that was a good album. I don't know what happened to it. Should have pushed it. Same old thing. But that was just, uh, that was management. The, the guy that had signed me to, to Epic Records, also was managing Ian Hunter. That's that's how we got together. How have you done with management? Like, were there early times early in your career when you kind of got the shaft from people, or? I get, I get the shaft for? today. What are you talking about? Man? <laughs> Shit. Man, management and and music don't it just don't mix. Period. That's the end of that. Yourself, or do you have somebody who takes care of all your? Well, I've, I've had, like, one person that worked with me that, you know, he was a roadie of mine, and I just got him to start doing a business for me, you know. I've never had a real, real manager, you know. I, with Weather Report, we had one, you know. But, you know, of course, we split from them, too. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a weird thing to get into. Managers are managers. That's what they do, you know. We're playing, and they, they don't, really don't think about us too much. There's only a couple of really good ones out there. Mm. Do you get that just from your attack, or do you have your action set really low? That? No, my action is, is not that low, as a matter of fact. It's sort of high. Not real high, but, but high enough to get good tone, you know? My, my real instruments are over in New York right now, so it's not, not that easy to really show you all that much, you know? But uh, this is just medium, you know, average. It's, it's not real low. I can't play with the action real low because I play very hard. Exactly. Where are these guys at that can play? You got your bass too, huh?
Thank you.